and welcome to World Inside with Tianwei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, President Trump is visiting President Macron in Paris in celebration of Bastille Day. Can these two leaders resolve their differences on climate change and trade to reach some kind of common ground? Turkey's geographical location between Europe, the Middle East, and Russia ensure it plays a unique role in geopolitics. I speak with former Turkish foreign minister to gauge the direction of the country's future. And we begin today's program in France. U.S. President Donald Trump is on his first state visit to the European country after being invited by the French President Emmanuel Macron. It's only been days after their last encounter during the G20 summit. While the two have conflicting stances on both climate and refugee crisis, France has been long-standing ally of the United States. So how do the two move past their grudges and forge or reforge the friendship across the Atlantic? Let's take a look. Donald Trump is in Paris, and it comes in the wake of his decision to pull the plug on the Paris Agreement to remove the U.S. from the pact. Paris? I don't go there anymore. Paris is no longer Paris. This is from a friend, Jim, who Trump quoted to demonstrate the importance of border security during his speech to U.S. conservatives in February. But this time, Trump seems to have ignored Jim. He's been invited by French President Emmanuel Macron as the guest of honor at Bastille Day celebrations. The Paris climate deal still remains a top priority when the two leaders sit down for discussions. On climate change, we know our differences. We have shared and expressed them on several occasions. And I think it is important to see how we can make progress on that matter. Macron says he respects Trump's decision to pull out of the accord. Trump has also hinted that he could shift his position on the Paris Climate Accord. Um, yeah, I mean, something could happen with respect to the Paris Accord. We'll see what happens. It seems like the two leaders have held a meeting with mutual respect, but their relationship did not get off to a friendly start. Macron painted himself as a global anti-Trump figure. Their first meeting in Brussels before the NATO summit was marked by aggressive body language. The two world leaders shared a long handshake, gripping each other's hands with grimacing faces. But at the G20 summit in Germany, the French leader traveled all the way from where he stands to the side next to Trump during group photos. With Trump at odds with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Macron seems to serve as a bridge between the U.S. and the rest of Europe. This is the U.S. president's second visit to Europe in a week. Some believe that such an act is Trump's intention to ease the cross-Atlantic relationship amid conflicts and disagreements. So what's the deal on um, President Trump's visit to France? Let's loop in our panelists. With us here in the Beijing studio, we have Mr. Wang Yiwei, who is a director of the Institute of International Affairs at Renmin University. Sir, welcome to our program. Joining us in Clemson, South Carolina in the U.S., we invited David Woodard, who is a Clemson University political science professor and Republican consultant. Joining us in Taipei, we have a French guest, Bachdelemy Gouhman, who is a senior research fellow at the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs. I hope I pronounce your name right, sir. In Berlin, Germany, we have Mr. Hanni Rinka, who is the head of the Transatlantic Relations Program, the German Council on Foreign Relations. Gentlemen, we have a very strong panel, and I want to begin with you. Professor Woodward, seems that both sides the French president and the American president, they need something to show to home and abroad that they deserve the title that they have, don't they? No, I don't, I don't agree. I think P Trump is going to be pretty popular regardless of what happens in Paris. I think he'll, he'll be just fine no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't think he needs an outcome. All right. What about you, Mr. Gouvermont? For a liberal French, uh, do you see the outcome the same as uh, Professor Woodward, who is a Republican consultant? Well, I think that both presidents are in a very different uh, situation right now when it comes to their uh, visibility and, uh, let's put it this way, credibility at the world level. Uh, Macron was uh, elected with a uh, landslide just a couple of months ago, and he got uh, 
a very high majority in the parliament a, long, a month later. He also appeared very consistent in all the uh, public appearance he made at the international stage. And on the other side, uh, Donald Trump is suffering uh, from a lack of uh, popularity uh, in the rest of the world, and especially in Western Europe. And he also faces uh, very difficult uh, difficulties at home uh, if we refer to uh, this uh, Russian uh, story that mm. is uh, poisoning the White House at the moment. So both presidents are in very, very different uh, situation right now. Mm. Professor Woodard, uh, do you think uh, the spotlight in Paris at the Bastille parade will be able to help President Trump to revitalize his image, at least abroad? I don't think he's that concerned about his image abroad. Uh, there's been a recent poll here in the United States that showed that 42 percent of the people were afraid to travel in France because of a fear of a terrorist attack. I think he is beginning to articulate some concerns Americans have about the EU and also about France. And even though his popularity is below 50 percent, I don't think there's any doubt that he'll probably be strong through 2018 and run for a second term. So I don't see him as being in danger. Mm, Professor Woodard is thinking long. What about you, Mr. Rika? Uh, what about that possibility to winning some hearts and minds in Europe, at least convey the concerns of the Americans to the Europeans? I mean, in Paris, there are, of course, two presidents um, looking for an outcome. Uh, Macron, who also invited Putin earlier to France, he wants to, to present himself as uh, a leading figure in Europe and he wants to, of course, ride on his wave of support. And um, I do believe that, that Trump uh, felt awkward about the, um, the, the isolation he had during the G20, about the, the, the bad press he got during the G7 uh, summit earlier. So to be treated as um, a statesman with, with the utmost amount of respect and, and pomp and, uh, and, and circumstance, I think this is, this is something that he can carry home and say, look, I'm, I'm internationally um, uh, the leader that, I, that America used to be. But in the end, the Europeans, they will look for results. They will look for um, the climate accord, which is a, which is a, um, a bad precedent, and they hope that uh, uh, the, the accord survives. They will look mm -hmm. at how um, the relationship with Russia is going, how the, the peace in Syria is going. So these, these are the topics that the Europeans have in mind. Right. But we all know that earlier there have been some quote-unquote tug of war between the French president and the American president, at least when it comes to the format of handshake. French President Emmanuel Macron made the headlines for so-called getting physical with Mr. Trump when they first met at the NATO summit and when they met in a group at the G20 in Hamburg. At their meeting in Brussels, each president gripped the other's hands with considerable, let's just put it that way, intensity. Their knuckles turning white and their jaws clenching and faces tightening. At least that's what the media wants to describe them. And the G20 seconds after the photo opportunity with all leaders finished, Mr. Macron made a beeline towards President Trump and began speaking to him. The pair walked in private as Mr. Macron tapped the U.S. president on the chest. Well, a lot of physical actions <laughs> over there. But the question is, I want to go to you, Mr. Gourmand. President Macron has to rise above the so-called this little fiscal, you know, tit-for-tat kinds of reactions and stories. He has to show his leadership. This is not enough just what the press has cooked. Can he really show his leadership when meeting with the biggest economy and certainly so-called leaders of the free world? Well, I think this is a very interesting move from Emmanuel Macron. As you have mentioned, during the G7 summit, they had this physical interaction, which uh, was uh, highly symbolic. And I think that Macron wanted uh, not only uh, to show uh, both Donald Trump and the rest of the world that he is in charge and that he is capable of some sort of leadership. I remind all of us that he's a very young leader. He's by far the youngest uh, leader in the G7 and even the G20. He's only 39 year old. Mm -hmm. uh, but also he had to reassure the uh, French public opinion uh, regarding the um, 
uh, image of uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is extremely unpopular in France. Uh, in the last poll, according to the last poll, only 14 people, uh, 14 percent, sorry, of the French population trust Donald Trump. It is very far from the results of Barack Obama, for instance, who reached more than 80 percent when he was president. So there is a uh, uh, an expectation uh, in uh, France uh, among the population that our president must somehow represent this resistance regarding the US president and therefore mm. it was a highly symbolic gesture from him not only uh, 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 to Donald Trump but also to the French public opinion and he was therefore a success. Yeah. On the other side, inviting Trump for this very important ceremony, if you want to compare with some other uh, such events, uh, you have to uh, mention Moscow, Pyongyang or Beijing. And to be honest with you, I don't think that Donald Trump uh, is likely to attend any of these uh, events in the near future. Mm. So it is a very uh, symbolic uh, gesture and inviting Trump, uh, this is the first time since Bush the father back in 1989 that a US president will be attending the 14th of July in France. So high, uh, high pressure uh, on Donald Trump, but also a very symbolic gesture, which is to show, look, yeah. we are your close friends. We are your partners. Nothing changes. I mean, we may have differences, but nothing changes. We still remain allies. Okay. Uh, Professor Wang here in Beijing. The two leaders, I have to say, they have some common ground. They are all charismatic in their own ways. And their election role does seem all to be, for many, surprisingly successful. Uh, but when they are coming together, they are seeking very different aspirations and messages to be conveyed in public. Do you think they will be in the same boat or just they are just going to talk to one another without really looking into each other's eyes? I think there is more uh, uh, Macron's uh, intention want to invite uh, uh, President uh, uh, Trump to uh, visit uh, France and uh, celebrate uh, the uh, anniversary. Day. Mm -hmm. I think uh, because the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Macron was considered about the little Napoleon, uh, so his ambitions is go beyond the European uh, Union as a uh, uh, driving force uh, between uh, uh, together with the Anglo Merkel. So to make up the relations, Atlantic relations, I think uh, uh, France need take a leading role. Given that uh, in the G20 and even before uh, uh, Merkel, you know, has. Uh, some difficulties relations with uh, uh, Trump, so uh, Macron want to, uh, to I think it be the bridge to connect uh, United States and uh, Europe again. Of course, uh, for the President Trump, also uh, they want to also uh, improve the relations with uh, Europe, and then Macron is the, I think the very important choice for him. Mm. Uh, Mr. Rika, what do you <laughs> think? I think that. Um, uh, Trump is demanding of the Europeans a number of things that other presidents wanted as well. But Trump has, has played with the possibility that he might be able to walk away from the table. Now, if we now have um, higher defense spending, uh, which is one topic that he insisted on quite a bit, um, it has not been because of Trump, it has been because of um, the risks around Europe, but he can cash that in as a success. But in the end, we, we talk about not only more spending, but willingness to, to get engaged in, in, in warfare, uh, to, to use the military force. And um, I, I don't think that the Europeans have changed that much. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be an interesting question how um, Americans and Europeans see their, their interests align and, and walk out together to fight terrorism, to, to create stability. Um, and I'm not sure that the Americans are really wanting, wanting that um, to be uh, an international uh, active player um, for international order anymore. And right. This is a pity. You know, Professor Wang, remember at the G20 or right after it, uh, the EU leaders have been expressing their curiosity about how the United States is likely to put into action about some of the attitudes or change of attitudes, apparently, that President Trump expressed, for example, in Poland, right before the G20, about the future relations between Europe and the United States within NATO, for example. Do you think this time President Trump can be more specific about what the actions might be? Or this is another reaffirming trip to France about the previous stances of the United States, which is not likely to win him 
more popular votes in Europe, at least. For a long time, I think the United, uh, European Union needs the United States more than the U.S. needs the uh, European Union. You see, before uh, President Trump arrived in the Europe, uh, uh, G20, the European Union uh, just verified the AFTA with mm. Japan. So they want to send signals that uh, without, even without TTIP, I have an uh, alternative choice. So actually, the intention to want to bring the U.S. in the track of the negotiation uh, TTIP, uh, including this time of the climate change deal, I think the United, European Union still need the U.S. because the European Union felt there are uncertainty, the relations with Russia, mm -hmm. even they also felt the challenges from, from China and other emerging countries, uh, particularly for the, uh, under the uh, conditions of the Brexit. Mm -hmm. So the United States, they came back to uh, the United States and then to American first. But European Union cannot a, a European Union first or a European first because European Union is very globalized. It's a multilateralism, uh, just, uh, uh, symbolically. All right. Mr. Gourmand, so it has to be successful. Yeah, I would like to come back to uh, the achievements that uh, the two uh, men can produce in the next two days. Uh, I think, first of all, Macron, let's face it, wants to impress Donald Trump. He wants to impress him about the fact that France is the main European military power, especially with the United Kingdom out of the EU. So that's why he invited him in this parade. Mm -hmm. They are going to talk security. They are going to talk uh, fighting terrorism. They are going to address several issues where Paris and Washington totally agree and therefore uh, different fields where they can work very actively together. So that's the first thing. He wants to impress his guest about the capacity that France is capable of uh, producing yeah. at the moment. I'll just remind you that in, uh, uh, in Africa uh, at the moment, uh, France is covering a zone that represents half the size of the United States and it's fighting terrorism in this zone. Mm -hmm. And I think that Donald Trump understood in the past few months that uh, making America great again is one slogan, but it has to be uh, achieved with uh, better, stronger alliances and with a better dialogue with its partners, especially on this sort of issue. So they're wow. going to talk about that. Yeah. On the other side, uh, Macron wants to convince, and he said that a few days ago, he wants to convince Trump about the Paris Agreement. He wants to have him back on track. I don't think he will succeed, to be honest with you. If he does, however, I believe that he will be the person of the year in Time magazine at the end of the year, and I wouldn't be surprised that he will be a very strong contender for the Peace Nobel Prize, just well, like Barack he, Obama back in 2009. But to be honest, he won't succeed there. But anyway, okay. he wants to convince him, and he still believes he can convince Trump that it is in the best interest of the United States to stay a global actor and not to choose this exit strategy. So this is what they're going to talk well, about. Well, you know, Mr. Gourmand, if he succeeded really doing that, as you described, both of them, President Trump and President Macron, will be on the Time magazine cover for the year 2017, I guess. But putting that aside, you know, <laughs> what you want to achieve <laughs> and what you think, once you achieve, will winning respect from the others could be different from whether others would really provide you with the kind of respect and the amount of respect that you want. And I guess that's a very interesting question I want to put to you, Mr. Rika. That is, France has this aspiration, but is what the beautiful calculation of President Macron likely to come into reality, particularly when it comes to other Europeans, how they're going to see France within the European continent? Is this going to change anything? I mean, if, if his ambition is to be man of the year and have a Nobel Prize, he would make Donald Trump a bitter enemy, of course, because I, I assume the American president will see um, these two awards as, uh, as in his own right. Sorry, that, that was a joke. Um, I think um, currently there is a wave of support for, um, uh, for, for Macron in, in France and, and, and in Europe, and there's a lot of hope. Because obviously Germany and France are, are, are developing better ties, and, and it, it, it's about bringing a new narrative to Europe. It's, it, it's about presenting the advantages of, of being in the European Union. Right. Germany's getting criticism for his, his uh, its, its trade, trade surplus from France as well, and, and we, we need to, to come to terms with that. But I think this is a great opportunity now 
to, to, to think jointly about what the European Union should do. For that, I think it is very important that uh, Macron succeeds in the, in the economic reforms in France. Uh, this is a very, very tall order. People say, look, Macron, he will have no time for Europe or the, or the rest of the world because he has all his hands full with reform in France. But even that would be good because it would show that um, uh, the European Union is actually an economic machinery mm. that sh uh, should not be underestimated. I think um, currently we should, we should build on the positive mood that is, that is n now there, and Germany is, is uh, absolutely willing to do that. All right. Mr. Wang, Professor, I want to ask you about that. Okay. Germany, France, they are developing certain kind of friendship, and they see it as collective partners uh, leading Europe for the future. But we don't want to forget, among countries between them, there is the competition. So how much of what is happening right now is President Macron trying to show to hear his German counterpart, see, I managed to do this, which you didn't eventually achieve. And how much will that provide President Macron with this bargaining chip, as President Trump would always like to use the phrase, uh, in terms of its relationship with Germany and the leadership role within Europe? Well, yes. Uh, now, because of the uh, Macron uh, taking power, so Germany the more self-confident said that well, Europeans will, should be more independent from the United States. And the European integration is to have a more uh, bright future than before. Uh, but the cooperation between Germany and the France is like this. Uh, the Germans took a low profile mm. because it's the, uh, for the Second World War uh, problems and then let the France take the leading role. But actually the decisions made under the table is more the uh, German's decision, uh, particularly, uh, particularly in the economic issues. Mm. But France, given that, that the French uh, security leadership in the uh, European integration and even globally, not just in France, uh, not just in Africa, but also in the Middle East. That's right. I think that President Trump will be uh, in, maybe persuade France to take a more leading role in the security, in the Syria, in anti-terror. That's possible. Even uh, Mr. Uh, Macron, his economic policy, uh, for instance, some similar uh, similarity with uh, Mr. Trump also has more job back and also protect the French interests. Mm. In this regard, they have some dispute with the, uh, Merkel because Merkel uh, led in uh, Germany the huge surplus and also free trade and also a uh, huge foreign reserve. Right. So further pressure from the United States as similar as China affairs. What do you think, Mr. Gourmand? Is that really the uh, potential likely? There are a lot of expectations about Macron's reforms and Macron's presidency in the rest of Europe. And therefore, there are certainly two different uh, missions, two different tasks for him. The first one is to appear credible at the international yeah. level, as we have mentioned earlier. But the second one is to engage very quickly the necessary reform in order to catch up uh, with the German economy, but also uh, to strengthen uh, the link between our two countries, which are extremely important and which indeed are crucial for the future of European Union. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, we, it is too early to know uh, whether or not he will be able to succeed, and it will largely uh, depend on the resistances that he will face. But what is certain is that inviting Trump, uh, like he does, uh, is, uh, is a strong signal not only that we don't want to leave the United States behind. That's a very important signal because, again, Donald Trump is not popular in European right. Union in general. But inviting him shows one very simple thing. Look, we may have disagreements with the current president, but we are strong allies and partners of the United States, and nothing uh, fundamentally changes right there. That is the other uh, strong signal is, look, we are an important actor, and, and when I say we, it's not France, it's European Union. All right. Someone has mentioned earlier the Jephthah Agreement with Japan signed a few days ago, actually the day before the G20 summit. Look, we are defending free trade, and we will continue on this track. Are you joining us? Are you following us or not? It is your duty now, and this is where well, I have mentioned earlier that know, Macron is putting some sort of pressure over Trump's shoulders. Well, uh, President Macron could articulate it that way, but whether President Trump is going to receive it that way is a very different question. Therefore, I want to go to you, Professor Woodard. I mean, earlier you have uh, very clearly brushed off the all kinds of importance your European colleagues try to put on this specific trip made by President Trump to France, at least from the European perspective. <laughs> <laughs> what is exactly this trip for President Trump? 
I mean, given that he does at this moment a lot of problems back at home, um, going to France is that going to free his spirit from all the troubles at home? Uh, getting a little bit more spotlight outside the United States, is it going to help with the 24 hours news cycle? Those, of course, are only shallow questions. Not fake news questions, but shallow questions. <laughs> Another question is, how exactly is the United States shaping its idea about what Europe means for the United States now and possibly in the near future? That is the fundamental question, Professor Woodard. 25 miles from this studio, 30,000 people are working for BMW producing cars in South Carolina. That is the major issue that Trump is concerned about, about working with Germany and working with Europe. It's primarily economic. He thinks we're making progress in that area. And he's really dismissive of the European Union. And, and I think that needs to be said, that the economy in the United States is surging and Trump is getting credit for it. And he may not be popular in the polls, but he wasn't popular in the polls before the election. And who is going to displace him? I see no one displacing him. So while his, his, his attitude is kind of controversial, mm -hmm. you have to think it's working politically. All right. I, and I don't agree that his popularity has to be good in, in Europe to be good here at home. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess, gentlemen, all of you have expressed your, where you come from and what is likely to be the result of this trip. I want to thank all of you. Certainly a lot of interesting occasions to look forward to from now on. Wang Yiwei, David Woodard, Bartholomew Gourmont, and Henning Rika. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Really appreciate it. You're watching Thank World Inside you. with Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN, still to come on our program. Turkey is located at the crossroads of Europe, the Middle East, and Russia, a position that ensures it plays a unique role in geopolitics. I speak with former Turkish foreign minister to find out where Turkey's future lies from his perspective. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Now let's move to Turkey, a transcontinental country in Eurasia. Due to its unique geographical position, relations with Europe has always played a central part of Turkish foreign policy. Its geopolitical potential plays a significant role in dealing with international issues, and its political stances have always attracted international attention. And today we bring insight from former Turkish foreign minister to shed light on Turkey's relations with the international community and where Turkey will go from here. And we have about 3 million Syrian in our country and we spend about eight, nine, ten billion dollars and we promised to get some from the European Union but that promise not fully been met yet. I think that agreement that uh, Turkey will, uh, will stop refugees not to pass to Turkey to Europe, and and Europe promised that free uh, well the free movement of people. Yes, from uh, Turkey. Yeah, but that does not happen. Mm. They are postponing. They are delaying, delaying all the time. If the EU is delaying that, what, how will Turkey react? Well, still Turkey is patiently waiting because uh, the, the, the worst thing to be to just let them go to Europe. It seems that Turkey has been playing a role of filter before the refugee coming from Syria getting to other countries of the European Union. But how long can Turkey play that role? Well, I think that was misassessment from the international community and Turkey as well. We're telling that Assad must go. And then, then try to find a military solution. I don't believe any military solution. And now in six years, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. 
millions of people uh, left their country with children, three million in Turkey with other neighboring countries, and this place inside of Syria. And uh, I think that that mistake is, uh, was big mistakes. And because at the beginning they could, they could sit with Assad and try to find a peaceful solution. My personal view was and is that to talk with Assad and not him himself, but to have a, some kind of internal government, inter well, not, not, let's say unity government. The people of Assad should be in that unity government and have a new constitution and then Assad could run for uh, election. Is it too late? Well, we lost a lot of time, a lot of life, but still, I think still that is the, should be solution. What role can Turkey play in that well, regard? Turkey, Turkey can alone, I think it's difficult because we need uh, Turkey with the international community, especially there are two important countries in the region, Russia and, and Iran. And they have role, and Russia has base in Syria. Turkey and Russia tried very hard recently to have better ties with one another. Our relationship with Russia and previously with Soviet Union is always a concept cups down and ups and down. But normally, of course, we are neighbor. We have very close relations, economic relations and, 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 and tourism and political relations and so on and so forth. And of course, we have some one problem uh, last because one of the Russian plane was shut down by Turkish uh, plane. Although that we legally we were had the right to do that, but I think we could be more careful not to do that. Now the situation is getting better, and I think the cooperation uh, between Turkey, Turkey and Russia and Syria is going well, but not only two countries. Turkey plays a significant role in issues affecting the Gulf region due to its unique geopolitical status. Turkey's stance has a great impact on security, economy, and even connectivity of nations in the Middle East. Regarding these issues, people are also willing to hear Turkey's point of view. Old world order seems to be now in a time of transition. Well, I think the, 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 the international system somehow collapsed and democracy also in crisis. And now we have a problem of what you call it the uh, populism and all over the Europe and United States. And this is, I think this is very critical and this is, uh, this is what I'm calling, this is a crisis of democracy. And I think uh, this will not last for for a long time. I think we will have a maybe new world order because we are now globalization is the, whether you like it or not, but it's going on. And, and, and no country can stop globalization. No one has right and has power to stop globalization. Now let's uh, have the new role, how we have a new political system, new economic system to, to, to deal with and be, be parallel with the globalization. I think the Belt and Road Initiative. Initiative is one of the global peace project or pro peace initiative. This is not the uh, initiative of China or Turkey, but I think all many countries in the world should join that idea. That will serve, that will help the peace and security in the many parts of the world in the future. But the question and one other thing, because, because we when you look at the world now, we were very optimistic after the collapse of Soviet Union that two blocks is now disappear and we will have peace, stability in all, all in the world. Forget about the world. We do not have even peace and stability in the European and, and in Euro Atlantic area as well. Why the reason is that? To my opinion, the main reason there is mi mistrust. But how to reduce the distrust? How to work there? Well, how to work there, I think to try to find a common, common project, common, common challenge to do it with and start with the easiest one. For example, now, everybody agreed that the, the one of the important challenges, terror. 
let's come together and let's work very hard together to deal with terror. The urgent one is terror because the life of human is concerned because this is, this is the number one issue. And then you go to others. Maybe the easy one will be to deal with, the, with poverty, with income distribution right. in, in, in the, some part of the world. Start one and two, they go to, it's not come to the end within a week or year, but let's accept that this is the key issues and the only solution is dialogue and talk.